Last week, a team of divers recovered a massive treasure from a 350-year-old shipwreck in the Bahamas. Whilst previous teams of treasure hunters have scoured the wreckage for centuries, this expedition is the first scientific survey and actually licensed by the Bahamian government. The recovered treasure is currently being displayed in the just recently opened Bahamas Maritime Museum. This ship was called the Nuestra Señora de las Maravillas. In English, that means Our Lady of Wonders. She was one of the many Spanish treasure galleons that annually delivered new world treasures back to Spain. Whilst the word galleon once encompassed the ship type used for war and trade, by the time of the Maravillas, it referred exclusively to treasure ships. In spite of popular imagery, pirates of the Golden Age had no interest in using these ships. They were slow, clumsy, and impossible to capture for them. The galleons sailed together in great treasure fleets, including escorts, scouts, and supply ships. It would be the equivalent of Somalian pirates today using cargo freighters. Um, they wouldn't get very far. And if pirates could capture a galleon and wanted to use it, they would have removed all the pretty decorations and cut down the heavy superstructure, and the ship wouldn't look at all, as we so often see in books and movies. And no, Blackbeard's ship was not a galleon. I know there are YouTube videos that claim this, uh, they don't have literary sources to prove their statements. <laughs> no historian or period sources have ever called the Queen Anne's Revenge a galleon. Anyway, back to the Maravillas. She was constructed in 1647, in the province of Kipotskoa, that's in the northern Spain in the Basque territory, and named after a 13th century sculpture of the Virgin Mary. Housed in a Carmelite convent in Madrid, this sculpture was said to give miracles. Weighing a whopping 891 tons, the galleon was built with two decks, 36 bronze cannons, and three bilge pumps. Her superstructure included three cabins with two galleries, uh, these are balconies running along the side of the stern castle, and her prow was peaked with the heroic figure of a golden lion. Owing to the Catholic religiosity of 17th century Spain, the stern was decorated with a devotional oil painting, and the ship was even built with a chapel in which she hold mass. When she departed Cartagena in August of 1654, as part of the annual treasure fleet, her crew consisted of 7 officers, 100 soldiers, 71 marines, 35 gunners, 30 seamen, and 11 apprentice seamen. 400 merchants and travelers accompanied the crew aboard the Maravillas. In 2022, the Dowers found a silver sword belonging to one of the soldiers aboard, Don Martín de Arande y Guzmán. So too did they find four pendants belonging to the ship's officers. These were religious commendations from the Knightly Order of Santiago, whose members were deeply involved in Spanish maritime activity. On the journey back to Europe, the treasure fleet had to pass through the Bahamas Channel between Florida and the unmapped reefs of the Bahamas. It was here that the navigator realized how the waters turned shallow. In the dark of night, the flagship tried to turn, but crashed into the side of the Maravillas. Thirty minutes later, the galleon violently struck a reef and sank. Enormous waves tore the ship to shreds. The people aboard were seized by the dark and cold waters. Only for the five of them lived to see the sunrise. The wreck of the Maravillas was possibly discovered back in 1982, when treasure hunter Robert Marks published a picture of its keel. Allegedly, at least. Since then, recovery attempts have been uh, dubious. The goals and methods of treasure hunters have always been questionable, and the industry has often been involved in money laundering, trafficking and fabrication. This picture shows a treasure hunting team guarding Spanish treasure, allegedly recovered from the Maravillas wreckage. The Maravillas gained an infamous reputation. The smash and grab tactics were thought to have destroyed the wreck forever. In 2016, multimillionaire philanthropist Carl Allen founded Allen X, a group of scientists dedicated to the first scientific study of the Maravillas wreck. An Icon A5 aircraft searches for wreckage from the air. Beneath the waves, a Triton submarine searches the deeps. Most of the painstaking work was done by magnetometers, navigational devices that measured magnetic fields. Tongued these behind their boats, the team scanned miles of seabed in search of artifacts. The team have worked with a license from the Bahamian government, and in 2022, the fruits of the work have been revealed to the public. The findings range from mundane items like shards of olive jars, iron straps used to rig cannons on the gun deck, anchors, wine bottles and tobacco pipes, 
to silver coins and jewelry. The findings serve as a window into 17th century Spain. Some items were naturally made or harvested in the American colonies, whilst others were brought by the Manila Galleon from Asia, such as Chinese porcelain. One of the finest items found is a two pound, six foot long golden chain. A similar item was worn by Philip IV, the King of Spain when the Maravilla sank. Whilst golden chains were often used as payment by merchants, historians believe this one to have been made by Chinese craftsmen for a noble commissioner. Alan X is committed to displaying their items in the Bahamas Maritime Museum. None of the artifacts are to be put on auction or sold. In the meantime, they will continue their hunt for the rest of the wreckage and the many other wrecks that litter the Bahamas. They are merely continuing a centuries-long local tradition of diving and recovering what was lost to sea. Indeed, neither Alan X or Robert Marx were the first to search the Maravillas. People in the 17th century had relatively sophisticated recovery methods. Most advanced was a diving bell. More rudimentary was just sending slave divers into the waters to just scoop stuff up. These methods were collectively known as fishing or wrecking. I'll have to make a separate video about wreck recovery, however. The first to attempt a recovery were, of course, the Spanish. The crown wasn't just about to let a royal ransomist lie and die on the bottom of the sea. In 1657 and 1667, two separate expeditions were sent, and between 76 and 79, the wreck was searched annually. However, its practitioners were usually less than trustworthy. Captain Iriarte was sentenced to death after he was found hiding gold from the 1657 salvage. The Spanish crown sued Juan Somovilla de Tejada and Gaspar de los Reyes Palacio for failing to declare one million pesos they recovered from the wreck. Countless corrupt officials, captains and individual divers have stuffed their pockets with undocumented pesos over the centuries. The hands of the original crew that crewed the Maravillas weren't so clean either. Despite Spain claimed the moral high ground of literally owning all of the Americas and every other nationality being a pirate and trespasser, smuggling was a national Spanish sport. Uncut emeralds and amethysts discovered in the wreck are especially common, but were not listed in the official cargo. Mm. Most of the recovered coins were minted in Mexico, mm. but the Maravillas didn't officially load coins in Mexico. Makes you think. At least 20% of the cargo that Spanish galleons carried back to Europe was contraband. The Spanish weren't the only ones to fish the Maravillas. Since 1630, the sparsely populated Bahamas had been settled by English Puritans seeking refuge from their Anglican oppressors. Stricken by poverty, these people made a meager living from salt raking, farming and fishing shipwrecks. The Bahamas has always been a graveyard of ships. To them, salvage was more than a get-rich-quick scheme. It was a way of life. Wreckage was used as fuel and building material. Sails made for tents, and old cannons were put in wooden forts made from hole planking. New Providence Island was first settled by wreckers seeking silver from the Maravillas, known to them as the Old Rack. The island housed one of the best harbors in the New World, a long beach where ships could careen and repair, shielded from the wind and weather by Hog Island to the north. The colony built on this location was called Charlestown, named after the King of England. The island was rich in provisions. Henry Pittman wrote how wild hogs inhabited the woods, ready to be hunted and put on a barbecue. There was a large store of wild grapes, which the inhabitants made a good wine of. Other fruits included oranges, lemons, limes and guavas. There were potatoes and yams aplenty. The island became a natural haven for pirates. In 1679, the Spanish crew worked the site when they were attacked by filibusters. The Spanish forced the French to flee until a cannon exploded aboard a Spanish ship, detonating the powder shards on the deck, killing 36 men, including the captain. The lucky Frenchman worked the site for two months, recovering 150 pigs of silver. Indeed, a typical crew could grab 12 pounds of silver a man. These pirates, wreckers and treasure hunters caused a severe strain on European political relations. In 1684, William Phipps was commissioned by the king to chase away the wreckers at the Maravilla site. He just ended up fishing it himself. Phipps became obsessed with treasure. In 1687 he recovered 250,000 pounds worth of silver from another shipwreck. He was eventually knighted, and during the Salem Witch Trials of 1692, he was the governor of Massachusetts. 
Soon the Spanish decided to put matter in their own hands. All the pirates were away and plundered the Maravillas. Juan de Alarcón led a raid on Charlestown. Commissioned by the governor of Cuba, Alarcón's two large piraguas came 200 men, surprised the town, burned it, and took away the inhabitants as prisoners. Though Governor Clark had been appointed by the English government, he had sponsored privateering as a way to defend and enrich the colony. The Spanish carried him back to Cuba, where he was executed. But the resilient peoples of the Bahamas were hard to suppress. The survivors fled to nearby Eleuthera, and one and a half years later they rebuilt Charlestown. Dr. Henry Pittman provides us with a detailed account of his visit to the rebuilt Wreckers Republic. The next day we steered into Providence and came to anchor under the command of a small stockade fort built by the new inhabitants, who had not been here above eight months, but had so well improved their time that they had built a town by the seaside and elected a governor from among themselves, who, with the consent of twelve more of the chief men of the island, made and enacted diverse laws for the good of their little commonwealth, being as yet under the protection of no prince. The privateers found a kind reception by the inhabitants, and after they had gotten their goods ashore, they ran their ship aground and burnt her, giving their guns to the inhabitants to fortify the island, decided to divide themselves into small members, and to go thence to some other place where they might sell their goods, and betake themselves to honest course of life. The governor of this island was a very sober man, and independent, and usually preached to the inhabitants every first day of the week, at which time he caused a gun to be fired for a signal, to give notices to the people when he was going to begin. Whilst I remained here, the privateers had two false alarms, supposing the Spaniards were come again to dispossess them of the island. These democratic tendencies came natural to the Puritan colonists. They were likewise some of the most racially tolerant people in the Americas. Many liberated slaves lived amongst them, and even the higher-up officials would marry with Africans. One of them was Thomas Walker, who had several children with his black wife, Sarah. He would later become a staunch opponent of Benjamin Hornigold, the man who would revive the little commonwealth in 1713. It wasn't until 1695 that the island would officially be resettled when Nicholas Trott was appointed governor of New Providence by the Bahamas Company. He ordered the construction of a stone fort to protect the town, which he renamed Nassau in honor of the new King of England, William III of House Orange Nassau. William had recently deposed a dynasty which Charles, the namesake of Charlestown, had been part of, so it was all a political popularity move. It would all later come as kind of ironic since many of the island's later piratical inhabitants were rabid Jacobites, a political movement seeking to restore the deposed dynasty. Right after they had gotten rich, drank enough rum, and uh, done enough damsels of questionable morals. Wanna, uh, you know, uh, do it! Trotz Nassau wasn't doing so well. The war with France had tanked the economy and news spread of French forces occupying the neighboring islands. On April's Fool's Day in 1696, Nassau was visited by a warship called the Fancy, captained by a certain Henry Bridgman. Hmm. The Fancy was armed to the teeth, showed signs of fierce battle, and was loaded to the gunnels with exotic cargo that could only have been stolen. All Bridgman wanted was to sell his ship and then dip, uh, no questions asked. He bribed, um, uh, paid the locals in Arabic silver. How could Nicholas refuse? Indeed, Henry Bridgman's true name was Henry Avery. A few months earlier, he had led the greatest pirate attack the world had seen uh, so far when he looted a Mughal convoy bound from Hajj to Mecca. The heist had caused a diplomatic crisis and sparked an international manhunt for the captain's head. Being a seasoned mariner and well-traveled in the Caribbean, he and his crew obviously knew of the piratical tradition and sympathies in the Bahamas. Trot gladly accepted the offer. After emptying out the cargo, Trot had a fancy run aground on Hog Island where she was picked clean. Some visiting mariners recognized her as the famous pirate ship, and Trot was brought in for questioning. Though he claimed he couldn't possibly have known of Bridgman's identity, the incident would lose him his governorship. Without Trot's energetic leadership, Nassau fell on hard times again. The French and Spanish sacked the colony several times, until it was reduced to a ghost town. After the war ended in 1713, a privateer named Benjamin Hornigold revived Nassau as a pirate base. Two years later, an entire Spanish treasure fleet was wrecked off the coast of Florida. 
would-be wreckers and treasure hunters flock to NASA, where they joined in the old Bahamian tradition of fishing wrecks for profit. Some call this period the true golden age of piracy, but really, it was the golden age of shipwreck hunting. These pirates were indeed treasure hunters. Their treasure was buried, sure, but in the sand beneath the sea. It wasn't marked by an X, but by the skeletons of ships torn asunder. But as the so-called flying gang picked the Florida wrecks clean of silver and gold, the Maravillas lay on the seabed, not so far from the den of debauchery. Forgotten, perhaps, but resting beneath the waves, waiting.